The sad days immediately following the double funeral were so filled with visits from relatives and old friends. Legal transactions necessary for the transfer of the estate of the old colonial. A successful tobacco factory in this time and 101 other engrossments that in the months afterward, they were hazy as an unpleasant dream. With the newly acquired calm which surprised him, Warren Jarvis left no stone unturned to ascertain with quiet inquiries the location of Jim Markham. There was no clue. The man had mounted a horse on the day of the shooting to disappear down the dusty Kentucky road. Leaving the village far behind and ignoring the possible escape by railroad. His simplicity was cunning for the Blue Hills, offered more avenues of disappearance than the iron roadbed of the local transportation. Equally cunning, however, was his determined pursuer. Warren Jarvis, after burying his parents and making the conventional round of respectful ceremonies, started again for his neglected business in New York. Here, he planned to adjust his affairs, then to return to the mountain country by a roundabout route to begin his manhunt. Incognito and unsuspected, he'll cover every mountain trail, every valley path until I find June Markham. He confided to Major Selby, his father's closest friend, as they stood on the train platform, waiting for the final minute of departure. When it happens, I will let you know. Major, until that time. Goodbye and God bless you. The train had come and unaccompanied by rusty snow. This time Jarvis clambered up the steps to wave to the old Kentucky. As the major turned away, he stroked his snowy mustache with a shrewd twinkle in his blue eyes to slow a quiet. I calculate the boy will make his father proud. The old viewed blood runs in the Jarvis veins and even the North can't spoil him. I wonder why Rusty didn't go along. That darky will be broken-hearted to be left behind on the old place. But Rusty knew very well why he had been left behind. And with all his jolly laughter, plump complacency and characteristic African simplicity. Rusty Snow possessed an inherent faculty of subtle concentration, which had served the family of Jarvis since the days when he had been a slave, Piccaninny. A week or more, he spent in the peaceful southern hamlet of Meadow Green in bibbing gin and ginger pop in the saloons frequented by those walking bureaus of information. The Negro Barbers. He consorted with darky jockeys and horse trainers. This was the center of the great thoroughbred breeding district. And everywhere he went with glistening smiles, laughing eyes and infectious amiability, he bore one query in his. Where was Jim Markham? The queries seemed unanswerable. Rusty confided his failure to Major Selby, who in turn sent a letter to Warren Jarvis at his New York club there. The latter was hastening his preparations for the great trek through the mountains. Warren had closed his office where profiting by his experiences in South and Central America. He had maintained a successful. All his affairs were in hand and that hand closed. All his outstanding investments had been hypothecated with shrewd advantage. At last he was ready certain that should he lose his life in the vengeful venture, his kinsfolk would be taken care of without legal complications. With all his inherited romantism, Jarvis of Kentucky was a man of A. He was sitting in the grill of his club, brooding over a solitary glass, unmindful of the friendly chatter of the members round him. When a uniformed page brought him a yellow envelope, he tore open the telegram since in important news. It was only from Meadow Green that he received his club mail and it was from Louisville that the message came. It was simple and yet it left him bewildered. Juan Jarvis, Export Club New, Come in with Malcolm, Buy Supplies, Rusty. At first, Warren smiled. Then he swore as only a chivalrous southerner can. Why should Rusty be coming with Markham? He could not have arrested or imprisoned him. What were the supplies? Evidently, this was some attempt at code, which was beyond his ability to guess. He spent the night and the next day in a perplexed mood. A wire sent to Major Selby inquiring as to the whereabouts of the Negro brought back the simple reply. Listen, no one knows. Toward evening after much perturbation, Warren decided upon a measure of preparedness for whatever might happen. 
he had given up his bachelor quarters on Madison Avenue two mornings previous in expectation of the long trip through Kentucky. One night he had spent at his club. Yet if Markham were coming to New York, it were best to be located in some place where he could cover his own identity without attracting attention. Such a place would naturally be a large hotel. Accordingly, he registered at the Hotel Belmont under an alias. This was close to the Grand Central Station, handy for a quick departure from town if such were necessary. Javis packed two suitcases with his modest needs for the southern trip and donned his evening clothes for dinner at the club. Several telephone calls convinced him that Rusty had not made an appearance as yet. When he reached the club, the big building was swarming with men of his acquaintance. Yet he seemed curiously apart from them. Since his father's murder and the death of his mother, he had proceeded under what engineers call forced draft. His nerves, like iron, had been drawn tight to the snapping point. Only some great climax of relief would disentangle the tense feelings that were now controlled with external calmness. The subsurface tremors, which warned him of an approaching catastrophe. For an hour, he sat brooding in the quiet library of the club. He had tried to eat, but all the artistry of the famous French chef could not conjure up an appetite. Men passed by him, glancing curiously at the usually jovial companion. The twisted, drawn expression surprised them. He tried to read a magazine. The printed lines pied themselves before his twitching eyes blurring into a vision of that last bitter scene in the room with his dying father. And even the vision had faded. Now to dissolve into one dull mass of color. A wavering, throbbing field of red. Mr. Warren Jarvis, Mr. Warren Jarvis. The page stood by the library door calling. He sprang to his feet, brought back to a consciousness of the present with galvanic suddenness. He turned bewildered for an instant and then slowly walked toward the boy. What is it? he asked. A man wants to see us, sir, down at the front door. A colored man. Jarvis waited for no more. He hurried down the oaken stairway out through the vestibule and hatless, breathless, relieved to a great extent from his tension. He caught the hand of faithful Rusty Snow. Lord, be praised, murmured that jubilant henchman. I done thought he might beat me to it. What do you mean, Rusty? Why didn't you come inside? That cup at the door wouldn't let no doc he come in. I want to talk to you right away. Moss Warren right away quick. Jarvis turned about with a direction to await him. He hurried to the coat room, caught up his light overcoat and hat, and rushed out through. Rusty helped him into the garment with fingers, tremulous with joy at the renewal of his familiar and loving task. Come, we'll go down the side street. I've given up my apartment and there's no place to talk. But the sidewalk. What did your telegram mean, Rusty? Well, sir, just what it said. I've done followed that man all the way from Meadow Green to the Manhattan Hotel. That's what it mean to the... Jarvis stopped and with eyes. Dilated, looked rusty, full in the face. Jim Markham in New York. What can he be doing here? Rusty chuckled. Me zero my boss. That's just what I thought at first. But now I knows I spent all my time and all the money I could bake off in the major trying to snoop around Dim Gin Mills down home to learn. And it wouldn't know until yesterday afternoon. Did I see this yard? Markham come galloping down on horseback with some poor white trash moonshine. A ride with him. They goes right to the depot and jumps off in the horses. I was in half black saloon, but they ain't nothing missing me. I walks over to the station agent's window and I sees this Markham with a roll of bills that would choke off the. He buys a ticket and then he goes down the platform. I axes hen barrows, the agent where that man going. He says New York. Didn't I satisfied? I just walked down to trap to the junction by the water tank. Hurry up, Rusty. What about? Was Warren's impatient interge. Well, I sees this young man with him watching the platform. And when the train pulled and injured, Markham goes. She all slews up at the sign because there's a junction. And so I jumped at the Han platform. Where Moss Warren, that man. 
He's on the train. It's only day coaches on till we gets to Louisville. And I walks from the Jim Crow car through the train just once. This Markham, he don't recollect me. I am just a darkie to him, but I sees him. I working in his seat with something that shows. He recollects you, sir. What was that, Rusty? He was all in a gun. And you know who that gun is for. He'll be looking for you. Moss Warren, what did you do then? How did you manage to stay on the train? Oh, I just stuck there. Moss Warren. This nigger has had enough experience in this world to know that he spends all he has when he has it. So the day you left, I takes the money you gives me for a railroad ticket and buys one and puts it inside my pocket. So I was ready for this Markham. I follow them to Louisville, where I telegram to you and keeps right on his trail when he changes cars for Cincinnati. He keeps on coming to New York. And I'm in the day coach all that time. Then I follows right to the Manhattan Hotel. He ain't never been in New York before because he walks all the way to the hotel instead of taking a taxi cab that many got no quality. Warren was lost in thought. He stopped at the next corner. This is a rusty. You did good work. I wanted to have you find him. And instead, he came right to me. Now we must end this whole thing tonight. For an instant, the Kentuckian was nonpulsed and instinctively turned to the old family servant with that curious trust, which the native southerner instinctively placed in family negro. What shall I do now, Rusty? Rusty's usually big eyes narrowed to slits in which the whites were hardly visible. Moss one. Just wait for that, man. He's here. You know that for your life. If you can't get him, I can. I got my razor. And that's a better weapon than any old gun. You just wait and let me do. Warren turned and started back toward the club. I'll be waiting at the export club. Rusty, if he hunts up my address on Madison Avenue, the hall boy will send him there. If he wants to see me, he already has my address. And everyone in Metal Green knows the club is my address. Now you go up to the rooms I have taken in the Belmont Hotel. The room number is 417. You just wait there until you hear from me. What did you mean by supplies in that telegram, Rusty? The dark. He chuckled. Lossy Moss Warren. I knows that you use a rag in New York about this time and don't carry the supplies of a gentleman. I mean, a 38 caliber. Has you got one? Warren smiled for the first time since their surprising meeting. No, I guess I have become a victim of New York. The worst weapon I have on me, Rusty, is a fountain pen. And I'm afraid Jim Markham couldn't read the ammunition. Rusty looked slyly about him. They were in a dark spot on Fifth Avenue. The shop fronts deserted and not a pedestrian within a block. The darkie slipped his hand into his pocket and surreptitiously handed his master a heavy, portentous automatic, which would have sent joy into the heart of a Texas Ranger. There was a vibration of honest pride in his voice, as he explained. Damn us wine. I went without poke chops and chicken all the way to New York. Just lay in supplies. And while I was waiting betwixt trains at Louisville aloud, you all be too wrapped up in your troubles to bottle about this. And I recommend that this year, a New York Sullivan law, which makes it a crime for a decent system to carry a gun so that the burglars can work in peace. Take it. Moss worn and plant ever seen in the right place. The tears came into the eyes of the Kentuckian, Rusty you're a jewel. Yes, sir. In a ebony. But now please get back to that club place and wait for Jim Malcolm. That man's mind was on his business when I seen him in the smoking car. And he ain't thinking nothing else. They strolled down toward the club again. Warren gave a few parting directions and handed Rusty a roll of bills for emergency. Remember, Rusty, when you hear from me by any message at all, you had come at once. I'll just mention my first name. I'm registered at the Belmont as John Kelly of New Orleans. I couldn't hide my southern accent. Tell them you're my valet and show the key. I can trust you to get up to the room if I call for you. Pay the bill from that change and don't let the grass grow under those. Number 12. 
Rusty smirked happily. Hallelujah, Moss, Warren Hughes, a joking again. The fight and blooded the Jarvis's violent eye. Why Moss Warren? I recollect your father when, but his master's face changed. Not now, Rusty. I'm thinking too much about my father. No more talk for either of us. Juiced. He turned into the side street toward the export club. Rusty, fresh from Kentucky psychology, doffed his cap and disappeared as Warren entered the Grecian port. Inside the clubhouse, he found a letter awaiting him. It was scrawled in the bold ungrammared style, which might have been expected. He read it standing tensely by the doorway as dozens of men walked in and out, little dreaming of the tragedy attached to that casual fragment of white notepaper. It was written on the stationery of the Hotel Manhattan, diagonally across the street from the hostelry where Warren had inadvertently registered for his brief stay in. He read the words again and again. Dear Jarvis, Export Club New. I'm visiting in New York and would like to see you and call off our quarrel. Your father's death was misunderstanding and we're last of our families. We'll be at Above Hotel all evening and tomorrow. Come around when you get chance and shake hands. I will prove I ain't meant no harm. Friend Jim Markham. The Kentuckian crumpled the note in his hand and then walked toward the fireplace of the grill. It had been weeks since any logs had been burned there. But the flakes of soot still clung to the stone casement. Warren struck a match and a curious smile illumined his face as he ignited the paper. Holding its flaming fabric between his fingers until the last half inch had burned. He dropped the tiny fragment after lighting his cigar with its flame. One of his friends, a Brazilian coffee merchant, addressed him in the native tongue, which Warren spoke as fluently as. Senor, you care, not for your letter. Oh, it's just a little invitation to a party tonight. Laughed Jarvis of Kentucky. If anyone found it on my person, you might think I kept late hours and associated with bad company. Let us have a drink to our friendship in the club for I may take a long journey tonight. And never see you again.